My name's Matt Simpkins. I'm an Anglican priest and musician. In this series of podcasts, I've been teasing out whispered light from the four last things of Advent, death, judgment, heaven and hell. Forced for the first time to properly contemplate my own mortality, last year I reflected deeply on these last things through the folk and gospel music that I love and those ancient profound lyrics, the Psalms. By their insights, I became aware of a faint rumour of hope, a slender thread of redemption that runs through them all in even their darkest moments, which I call whispered light. Amid the suffering and uncertainty of the Covid pandemic, I'd like to share that sense of whispered light with you. Whispered Light, an Advent podcast on the four last things, death, judgment, heaven and hell, explored through songs and the Psalms. Episode 4, Hell. I don't want to go down there. Our last, last thing is hell, a dark subject indeed. But the depth of the darkness of hell might help us glimpse that whispered light by putting it into relief. As Advent moves towards Christmas, the darkness of the days steadily increases until, with a handful of days to go, the light of the coming of Jesus starts to seep in. In this episode, I want to suggest that the whispered light in death, judgment, heaven and hell is the same light that we await at Christmas. The light that we read shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. The light of Emmanuel, a name for Jesus that means God with us. Around the time we reach that darkest point of the year, we begin singing the O antiphons in church. They are bits of beautiful plain chant about Emmanuel, God with us. In Latin, we might sing Veni Emmanuel. We plead, O come, O come, Emmanuel, God with us. And as we await the Christ child at Christmas, so we simultaneously await his return at the end of time. O come, O come, God with us. O won't you come again, Lord. So over the next half an hour or so, we'll travel. We'll travel through the darkness of hell in order to arrive at a manger in Bethlehem. Don't 
there are fewer gospel songs about hell than you might think. On June 11th, 1939, a couple, Alan and Ruby Lomax, found themselves near Sand Springs, South Carolina. Ruby, a great folklorist, and Alan, a legendary capturer of field recordings, were out seeking for songs. And they found some when they chanced upon a chain gang of prisoners working at the side of a road. The Lomax's notes show that the chain gang performed one song in close harmony using hambone, that is, a rhythmic accompaniment made by slapping their limbs together. The song sung was Hell Down There. To be found out on a country road like this usually means that the song has deep roots. Whatever they are, however, those roots are completely lost to us. It was almost a decade before this song became famous when, under the title I Don't Want to Go Down There, it was released on 78 by the two gospel keys, guitarist Emma Daniels and mother Sally Jones singing and playing tambourine. The song presents some classic images of hell, that it's a place below as opposed to heaven, which is above. That there are flames and suffering there. And most importantly, that it is somewhere most certainly to be avoided. Those of us privileged to have never experienced a chain gang at first hand might well consider that experience to be a form of hell itself. Yet amid the suffering of this chain gang, there was still worse to be imagined. And maybe that's the true role of hell, to be a focal point for all that brings misery and suffering in our present lives, the place of deepest darkness. It might be, however, that despite the sincerity in this song, many of us consider hell to be a bit of a joke. Along with sin, hell has become a word which these days communicates a frisson of desirable naughtiness. Rather than leaving us quaking in our boots, hell is more likely to cause a raised eyebrow and a chuckle. Hell has been tamed into a ludicrous fiction of demons with roasting forks surrounded by flames. And by the way, to most Christians that particular image is a fiction too. My early teenage obsession with the bands Megadeth and Black Sabbath was as much about laughing at the delicious pantomime of hell and the devil as it was about the riffs and the hair. We laugh at the baddies and bad things that we think can't really get us. But the more of life and death I have experienced, the more I think I do actually know something about hell. Like heaven, hell is an idea suffocating under fictions and confusions. But that doesn't mean we should jettison it. The Dominican friar Herbert McCabe was both wise and funny. His take on the problem of considering hell is as insightful as it is amusing. If hell as a burning lake of fire does exist, then where does that leave our understanding of God? If God is the kind of person who enjoys pushing people into boiling sulphur, McCabe observes, he must be a maniac. This is not adult behaviour at all. That is, of course, not the God in whom Christians believe. And yet McCabe is clear that, even if we cut away the nonsense around the idea, we can't simply soften the notion of hell away. If, after examining the concept of hell, he writes, cutting out the mythological and metaphorical bits, one comes to the conclusion that it may not be so bad after all, then clearly one has gone wrong somewhere. So we're left with a hell that doesn't have forked tails and roasting spits, but that is still terrible. What exactly is stopping us getting rid of the idea, however? 
What if the notion of hell might help us reflect on the pain and difficulties of this life? To some Christians, the best way of thinking of hell is to consider it as the absence of God, our estrangement from God. Bishop Richard Harris, a great writer on the problem of evil and suffering, suggests that if we think of hell like this, then we best visualise it not as some fiery pit, but as a man being crucified on a hill called Golgotha. Jesus on the cross enters into the literal hell of our estrangement from God. He enters hell on behalf of humanity. And because he is still the eternal son at one with his father, lifts that hell to God, Harris writes. And suddenly the crucifixion becomes a moment where all human suffering, brokenness and sin are taken up. They are shown to be a form of estrangement and absence. And at that point, every dark aspect of our existence is touched with Jesus's presence, Harry's again. While it is true that there are many kinds of suffering that Jesus did not experience, some of which seem just one long crucifixion, the most fundamental darkness is our alienation from God, and it is this he entered and overcame. Christians say in one important statement of faith, the Apostles' Creed, that after his death Christ descended to hell. A whole tradition of the harrowing of hell, Jesus' preaching of the gospel in hell, grew up and is a regular subject of Christian art. It is a descent intended for the raising up of many. As the medieval mystic Julian of Norwich explains, when he was there in hell, then he raised up the great host out of the deep abyss, which had been truly knit to him in high heaven. So it seems that we might each know more about hell than we'd realised. All our estrangements from each other, our fallings out, miscommunications, broken relationships, sadness, all our suffering, our isolation, our guilt, our self-loathing, all our lashings out, our hateful words and actions, all our alienation, are echoes of hell. But to name them as echoes of hell is simultaneously to say that Christ is present with us when we experience those things. Sometimes I'm asked if my faith is a sort of crutch or a helpful positive mental attitude. I tend to respond that there's no promise for Christians that we won't experience these echoes of hell in this life. There's no magical protection from bad things. Such a thing would be so divorced from the reality of the world we know, a reality which for all its suffering and sorrow is so vividly depicted in the Bible as to be utterly ridiculous. But in Christianity there is the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. A God who has literally been through hell can go through any figurative hell with us. But for those of us living now, the hellishness of alienation, suffering and estrangement is very real. The hell of these things has been refined for us by Covid. I serve an area that has been relatively unaffected. But my life as a priest has given me some small glimpse of the depth of the sorrow and suffering that has accompanied the disease. Relatives desperate for news of a dying loved one as they watch through plate glass or wait by a telephone at home, unable to do something as simple and human as hold one another's hand. Mourners, separated from each other at funerals, tears running down into their masks, while those desperate to hug them can only stand back. Wives, separated from husbands in care homes for months on end, all the while knowing that this absence 
likely worsens their dementia. Teachers and nurses and doctors and cleaners and delivery drivers and publicans and so many others slowly buckling under the stress of it all. Food banks full as economic uncertainty overwhelms household after household. And the lonely going for weeks on end without seeing a single soul in the flesh. Because I am a parish priest, people bring these things to me, and that is a privilege. But I'm not some spiritual expert. I'm never quite sure I know what I'm doing or that I have the answers. Yet I can be there, even on the phone, to listen and pray. Sometimes I have a little sob at my desk and feel guilty for my own fevered prayers that my family might be spared such sufferings. Recently, some priests from Burnley, an area severely affected by COVID, appeared on the BBC. At the end of their interview, they wept. It was a profoundly articulate comment on that situation. Knowing we have nothing to offer ourselves isn't false modesty nor pessimism. Rather, it pushes everything out of the way. It lays bare what's left when everything else fails. And what's left is to turn to God, to cry to God, to try to point people towards the hope in God, that whispered light. What I learned from my own fleetingly dark time last year has proven so valuable this year that when I felt I had nothing left to offer when I could not face preaching about hope when I found the words of prayers increasingly absurd through the gift of the psalms and music I could cry out to God oh come oh come Emmanuel and ransom captive Israel that moans in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. shall come to the all Israel Oh come thou branch of Jesse free thine own from Satan's tyranny from death of hell thy people save and give them victory o'er the grave rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. The Psalms don't portray a fiery hell. Instead, they sing about Sheol, a pit where we go when we die, a dark place. But as I discovered last year, the Psalms offer another place, a place where we can go when we feel we've reached the bottom. 
They are songs to be sung from the middle of deep darkness, amid the breakers and the swells of the big sea, the chaos waters. No emotion is untouched by these psalms, even depression, isolation, faithlessness. When we find ourselves in that sort of hell, the psalms give us something to sing. They even give us something to sing when our apparent alienation from God is all we can see or feel. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. O let your ears be attentive to the sound of my pleadings. Sing Psalm 130. Psalm 39. Hear my prayer, O Lord. And give ear to my cry. Do not hold your peace at my tears. Psalm 88. My soul is full of troubles. My life draws near to the land of death. I'm counted as one gone down to the pit. I'm like one that has no strength. Lost among the dead. Like the slain who lie in the grave. Whom you remember no more. For they are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in a place of darkness in the abyss. Lord, why have you rejected my soul? Why have you hidden your face from me? And when the darkness seems utterly overwhelming, we can know that we are not totally alone as our voices join that of the psalmist. Deep calls to deep, in the thunder of your waterfalls. All your breakers and waves have gone over me, cries Psalm 42. Psalm 44. Rouse yourself. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Awake, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For we sink down to the dust, our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up, come to our help, redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. And then there is the most powerful cry of all. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. But we've heard those words of Psalm 22 before on the lips of Jesus, Emmanuel, as he went through the hell of estrangement on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When we sing or pray the Psalms, even the darkest, most desperate Psalms, we pray them with him. And Jesus brings those things, those hellish things to God. There is no dark nor dreadful part of our lives that the whispered light of Christ's presence cannot infuse because he is God with us, Emmanuel, even to the depths of hell. Which is not to say that all is suddenly well, but that when things are bad, when we can't face something, when we can't face ourselves, when we can't face God even, we know we are not alone in this. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is there. And as Advent closes, that Emmanuel is coming. The light is seeping in. This Emmanuel is with us on good days and bad. When we lift our voices in joy or doubt or desperation, it is precisely because of his experience of hell. Whether we want to think of it as his estrangement on the cross or his descent to Hades, that 
he can be Emmanuel, God with us. That is the inextinguishable light whispered through hell. Where do you find yourself today? If you are sitting waiting for news of a family member or carrying the burden of great responsibility, if you're racked with mourning or stress or if you're watching a loved one die, I believe that Emmanuel is with you. And I believe that every tear we shed is shed by Jesus also for us in front of the Father. When we cry out with the Psalms, even when we cry out, God, why have you forsaken me? Our voice joins his and rises. The story of how this Emmanuel arrived, stripped of all those romantic extra bits, tells us much about this God with us. The Bible's accounts of the Holy Family as they prepared for Jesus' arrival speak so much of what Jesus was to accomplish. And so we sing Veni, Emmanuel, O come, O come, God with us. Amid the reality of our experience of alienation, illness, suffering, frustration, amid the misery of Covid, O come, O come, God with us. And this is how he first came. They trudged through cold nights and drawn out days towards a hometown that wasn't home at all. Each step carried them farther from the safety they knew and craved for their coming infant. They wore the fears and anxieties of this first pregnancy around their shoulders. It was as strangers that they arrived at their destination. They could find no proper shelter. No midwife could be recruited. There were no relatives with reassuring wisdom and calming voices to guide them through. Just the damp of a stable and the smell and the dirt, and the trepidation that rose with each contraction. Mary felt her body doing things she'd not known before. Joseph watched on in the half-light, trying to say the right thing, trying to hold her hand at the right time, but inside he felt helpless to help. In those moments, the sense of joyful anticipation seemed swamped by waves of chaos and messiness. All those unknown things, those whispers of shame, the constant braying of the animals, the stench, the worry. How could the wonderful moment be allowed to happen in this way? And as the final contraction came, it felt as though the shadows might finally overwhelm them. They were alone, terrified, lost. They knew and cherished and acted faithfully on God's promises, but suddenly all the darkness of the past, all the muddle and disappointment of their lives, all the confusion of the situation began to swallow them, curling over them like a black storm wave. He squeezed her hand with all his strength. She cried and pushed and gasped. The dark swell above them seemed about to crash down. But then, 